Okay, I think we're going to start now. We still have some more people joining us. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jane Eisner. I'm speaking to you from the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia University, where I am the Director of Academic Affairs. And I'm really pleased and honored to be part of this conversation. Um, the lengthy investigative story published Sunday in the New York Times described how scores of schools in Hasidic communities in New York State, known as yeshivas, are failing to educate their students in secular subjects. They offer little English and math, virtually no science or history, and as a result, students overwhelmingly fail to pass state standardized tests. Moreover, the story found numerous incidents of child abuse in the classroom that are not reported to the authorities, and the separate education system comes at a great cost to New York taxpayers, who the Times said has sent about a billion dollars uh, to Hasidic boys schools in the last four years alone. Here to discuss this story and its ramifications are Naftali Muster, founder and executive director of Young Advocates for Fair Education, known as Yafed, who was raised in the Hasidic community as one of 17 children and knows firsthand of the dire consequences of this educational deprivation. David Bloomfield, professor of education leadership, law and policy at Brooklyn College and the CUNY Graduate Center. Among other things, he has served as general counsel to the New York City Board of Education. And Shira Dicker, a writer, strategist and activist who has been working with Yafed and knows the Jewish community intimately. You are welcome to send questions to the chat or to the Q&A, and we will try to incorporate them into our discussion as best we can. Um, this is also being recorded, so if you miss some of it or want to share it afterwards, please do. Naftali, I'd like to start with you because you are truly closest to this crisis. What did you find most revealing and compelling about the New York Times story? And did it get anything wrong? Uh, first of all, thank you so much for moderating, um, Jane. Um, uh, I, it's a very long piece. And uh, on one foot, I'm not sure if I can think of you know everything. Um, but I guess, to me, what I think is most impressive about the Times piece is the fact that they spoke to over 275 people. This, this includes yeshiva graduates, parents, um, you know, yeshiva administrators, teachers, and, and all of that. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't read the Times, you know, religiously, but I don't know of any other instance where they went to such great lengths to, um, to speak to as many sort of witnesses as possible, uh, numbering over 275. And I think this speaks to their, they're well aware of the fact that they're going to be, uh, they're, they're going to be discredited or people are going to try to discredit them. They've followed this story. They've seen how yeshiva leaders work and they went to such great lengths to basically, uh, uh, what's the expression, cross the T's and dot the I's and, and to verify it again and again and again. Um, and I think this really does give a ton of credibility um, to the issue. And, and it also begs the question of why the Times was able to do it in a matter of like two plus years and the city and the state after 10 years is still haven't gotten their facts straight. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of what the Times got wrong, um, again, you know, I feel like when I read the piece, it was almost always like, oh, well, of course, of course, Yafet has known this for some time. Where, you know, there were a few surprises that, you know, even to us, and then, uh, can, can you just describe one or two surprises? Um, okay, here's one. Um, that at some point, the city was asking the state for help, and the state, no, the city wanted to write to the state asking for help, and the state mm -hmm. told the city not to. Mm -hmm. this, the, the piece just glosses over that as if, like, it's like, this is a bombshell. Like, tell us more. You know, I want to know. What actually happened? Who is the person? Who are the people who, you know? So maybe in the future, more of it will come out. But this was surprising to me. But in terms of what the piece may have gotten wrong, I don't know if it's wrong, but I think that, again, the Times wanted to go out of the way to sort of 
to be balanced. And the truth is, in educational neglect, just like in other abuses, you can't be balanced. You can't both sides the issue. But to the extent that they could, they wanted to show that they respect the community's way of life and so forth. So they sort of played up the Judaic studies. And I got to say, as someone who went to Hasidic yeshiva, the Judaic study, the rigor of the Judaic studies is not what it's all, you know, hyped up to be. Um, and, and, you know, in some ways, people get surprised when they learn that actually Hasidic kids, yes, Talmud, they study it a lot. The rigor can be questioned, it is or isn't, but like in a lot of Jewish studies, we just, we, we aren't taught those. So anyway, I want to, I want you to pass to, on to other um, panelists, but those are some of the things that stood out to me. Great. Well, thank you. So uh, with David, I'd like to pick up on some of what Naftali just mentioned. You are really a student um, and uh and deeply involved in city and state government and educational oversight, and you've written a lot about this. Uh, the story says that both the city and the state ignored this crisis for years, perhaps even complicitly. Um, walk us through that. What are the policy implications for this kind of behavior on the part of our governments? Right, so, so understand that this is a hundred year old statute uh, it's well, in, explain what the statute is. Right. This is a state law passed by the legislature. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been amended, uh, but it's on the books and it requires all private schools in New York State, not singling out religious schools, not singling out yeshivas. All private schools have to have a substantially equivalent secular instruction program for their students. We want our students to be productive citizens. Uh, they can sit on juries, be informed uh, voters. Uh, we want them to be able to earn a living. We want them to be able to fill whatever destiny they want for themselves. Mm -hmm. And for a hundred years, uh, maybe 99 years until uh, Naftali came along, uh, this law sat on the books and was effectively ignored. But at the same time, we all generally believed that the private schools were doing what private schools and what, what tuition paying parents want, which is to teach secular subjects. Mm -hmm. Naftali comes along and realizes that, or lets us all know that this isn't being done in some of these ultra-Orthodox yeshivas. The mayor is supposed to initiate an investigation of this because under the state education law, it's for the school district where the private school exists to make sure that all the children in the district are being educated. Mm -hmm. uh, I wrote back in 2017 that Bill de Blasio, this is long before COVID, so don't believe the de Blasio excuse mm -hmm. COVID that held him up. His own Department of Education had determined that he horse traded the delay for his reelection campaign and for uh, mayoral control of the public schools. So uh, the state, the feds, the city are all entangled with the Haredi community to make this go away. And, and it's thanks to uh, Naftali and it's thanks to the New York Times and many, many other journalists through the years. I've got to say, you know, hats off to the Times for giving mm -hmm. Eliza Shapiro and Brian Rosenthal two years to work on this and really get it into depth. But this is not something that hasn't been covered. It's not an underreported story. It's right maybe an underpublicized story. Uh, but that's what has to happen now. There needs to be a, a complete thorough enforcement, not mere investigation, but enforcement of this law. The conduct that's been taking place is illegal. Thank you. Well, it's interesting you say that. You know, I was editor of The Forward for more than a decade and we certainly published a lot of stories and essays about this issue or from the classroom, but you know, I certainly couldn't have two reporters spend full time on this for two years. Uh, 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 there'd be nothing left. Um, and and I do think that the level of data in this story is quite astonishing. Still, Shira, that has not stopped um, many many people uh, from pushing back on this story uh, on social media. 
In fact, publishing in some cases, pieces um, uh, criticizing the story before the story was even published. And frankly, you look back at that and you say, wow, they were criticizing things that actually were addressed in the story. Um, so this was a very unusual situation. For the first time ever, the New York Times uh, translated the entire investigation into not just Yiddish, but Hasidic Yiddish, so that that, that, that population would be able to read it. Um, my understanding is there are more than 3,000 comments on the, on the website, and they had to just shut down comments because it was just too much. You know, what accounts for this interest? All right, thank you. And I'm, I'm smiling because this is my absolute perfect kind of project. It is at the absolute intersection of everything that I care about, everything that I love, everything that I will go to the mat for. What is behind this interest? Who said this? Naftali said this. David said this. We all know this. It is not an unknown issue. It's out there, but nothing has been done. And everyone is on, if I can use a Yiddish word, spilkas. Everyone has been watching this in some capacity or another. Is something going to be done about the fact that tens of thousands of these Hasidic kids, these school children, you know, our, our family are not getting the proper education, the basis for success in life, and worse, I mean, the heartbreaking revelations about abuse, again, not interfamilial, but in the classroom, in their schools. So we know about it. There's something we're familiar with this. This story, when it appeared, it's not something no one ever heard of. It confirms things people knew about. But Jane, as you say, it backs it up with the most remarkable research. I mean, I'm a proud graduate of the school in which you you serve and sit right now, Columbia uh, Graduate School of Journalism. And I imagine that this story is going to be taught, right? It's going to be, to talk about deconstructed, deconstructed for years and maybe decades to come. It really is a shining example of investigative journalism. Every fact that is stated is backed up with research. Um, so this is a story, it is, it is of great local interest. Very few people were unaware. I think what accounts for the interest though is people did not know the extent. This story fills out the frames, the outlines, right? For things that people knew about, heard about. Um, and I will say, I mean, it is really, and I urge people on this um, tuning in, go online and just Google. You can have a festival. You will not do your work for the rest of the day. The comments did max out on the New York Times site at almost 3,400. Twitter has been filled with the most remarkable conversation. Facebook, and I've been surprised. Yes, there have been some people saying some of the predictable you know, um, defensive reactions, and they are heartbreaking, the anti-Semitic New York Times, Nazi, all this other kind of stuff. Um, but where I have been surprised is, um, and I will name this because it's public record, it is online. For instance, this morning, I just checked out Facebook. Rabbi Shaul Robinson, the rabbi of Lincoln Square Synagogue, wrote a post where he's highly critical of the New York Times. I guess in journalism, we would call this blaming the messenger for the message. And I thought when I saw that post, oh, he's going to get a lot of amen, you know, amen, rabbi. Not at all. The pushback and the arguing is, is beautiful and it's respectful. And I'll say just one last thing. I've been surprised there's something I did not anticipate, and that's the heartbreaking comments by people who, like Naftali, come from this world. And they are happy to see sunlight, the best disinfectant, shown on this problem, but they're also traumatized. They're also traumatized by the memories of what they live through. And people are calling for compassion. And finally, people are calling for compassion for the Hasidic community. This is not the fault of the children, their victims. It's not the fault of the families. Um, Beatrice Weber, one of our parent ambassadors, says, what do you think? The parents want to keep their children functionally illiterate? No. 
They want the best for their children, the same as every parent everywhere. So this story ticks off every single box of interest. It touches our heart, it touches our soul, it touches our minds, and it validates what we have been seeing. Thank you, Shira. So it seems that embedded in, yes, David? Unmute. David, can you unmute? Yes, sorry, but it touches our wallet as well. Uh, so uh, people, this is uh, one of the, surprising things in, in this time story was that the government isn't even keeping track of the money that's going to, to these schools. Now, forget about the accountability, like that they're not getting bang for the buck. They don't even know where the bucks are coming from. Uh, it was the Times through their hard work tracking the, the, money. So, so the money. So uh, we call it Yeshiva Gate. And, and we call it Yeshiva Gate for a number of reasons, but one reason we call it Yeshiva Gate is follow the money. Well, thank you. Um, I, I wanna pick up on some of the criticisms that um, not just the story, but the whole sort of question of, um, of accountability for what happens in these schools. You know, embedded in the defense of the Yeshiva system, and I understand that the argument is that it's actually separate schools, not an entire network. Still, it is an approach to education. And embedded in that is the idea that parents have a right to choose what kind of education their children receive. And that religious freedom argument, I think, actually resonates through many other communities across the United States, um, well beyond Hasidic Jews. I'm wondering how any of you might respond to that. What, what do you say to somebody who says this further regulation would violate our religious freedom? Well, I'll pick up uh, initially, uh, education is a public good. Uh, the reason we have a public school system, the reason all of this money is invested, public money in private schools, uh, I, you know, we say that um, charter schools are public charter schools. Well, these are really public private schools. Uh, they are supported with tax dollars because it's in the interest of everyone to have an educated citizenry. Nobody is saying that parents don't have a right to send their children to private schools and that the private schools get to um, have a, a curriculum that is in keeping with their mission, religious or secular. But there are certain subjects, and that's all we're really talking about in terms of this law. There are certain subjects that the state, that the society has a responsibility to teach everyone. And that is not only the Declaration of Independence, I mean, I'm talking about what's in the law, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Underground Railroad, the Holocaust, Everybody should know about these things, uh, whether or not uh, that's a, a matter of religious practice or otherwise. It, it just simply is, is not antithetical to religious observance. And are there examples of deeply religious school systems that still um, comprehensively teach secular subjects? I mean, I know I, I'm a day school parent, and I, I think my kids learned a whole lot about Jewish life and language and religion and history, uh, but you know, also took calculus and, uh, and AP history. Um, but the, that, the schools that my children went to were, you might consider either conservative or pluralistic. I'm just wondering, are there examples in, in and even a more strictly conventional religious communities that do manage to do both. All of the Catholic parochial schools in, in New York City do both. So uh, mm -hmm. if you're looking for a, an example, there it is. Right, Jane, I'll, I'll pick up from that. You know, um, I went to Bell's Hasidic boys schools my entire childhood. Okay, Bell's is a Hasidic sect which is part of the ultra-Orthodox umbrella or Haredi umbrella. And I got the education that's being reported, right? Basically 90 minutes or less in, sec uh, in elementary and middle school and zero uh, secular education in high school. 
my sisters, of which I have many, um, they received a decent secular education. In fact, you know, when I would come home after a full day of Judaic only studies, um, my sisters would sit around the table and do their secular studies homework. That would be the only place I ever heard the names of former presidents, the names of other states in the United States, the names of capitals around the world. Um, you know, oftentimes they would do it in a certain song. Um, as a Hasidic boy, I would be like, shh, I'm not allowed to hear a girl singing. But the point is like, the Hasidic girls get the education that we envy, that we want to see for our boys. So much so that I always tell people, you know, if only the Hasidic boys yeshiva, like the one I attended, gave the same education as the Hasidic girls schools, like the one my own sisters attended, there would be no Yafet, right? Because we're not really after trying to sort of mold them like public schools or even make them like, you know, Ramaz, but mm -hmm. just Hasidic girls schools. And then you have Litvish schools, both boys and girls for the most part. They are ultra Orthodox. They are in the Haredi network. And many of them provide a pretty decent secular education. Again, I don't know if they would necessarily meet the full definition of substantial equivalency, but the same thing. If all Hasidic yeshivas provided that kind of education, none of us would be compelled to, to uh, 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 raise this kind of alarm about the lack of education. And we would have allowed it to continue as it is. And that's something also you touched on earlier. I don't remember when, but like, I don't think the public, I think that's what the piece brought out in much greater clarity. Mm -hmm. The public may not, may still not comprehend what we are dealing with, what we're discussing. Many people, especially on the right, they automatically assume this is an assault on religious education, right? In their mind, the visual they have is a Catholic school or maybe like a, a, a Ramaz or something where they got a little bit of religious education, oftentimes at the end of the day um, um, or sometimes on Sundays. And they think we're after that. They, they cannot comprehend that we're talking about a system where in elementary and middle school, kid, kids get no secular education until 3.30 p.m. and only for about 90 minutes if they're lucky. And then once they enter high school, they get zero secular education, right? I spent um, every waking moment um, when I was 14 to 16 and, and older in the building of a Hasidic yeshiva. And we got zero secular education, no exposure to the secular world whatsoever, only surrounded by people who looked exactly like us. So in that kind of situation, it's just, it's so limiting. And, and that's what people cannot get about the, the situation. And if that weren't the case, there would be no yafet, there would be no, no incentive, no desire to try to change this uh, system. Sure, I want to add you, um, but uh, I'm sorry, may I just quickly follow up on two things briefly that you said. Why is it different for girls? Um, and why are some in the Haredi world able to offer this education and others not? Like, what's behind that? Help us unpack that. Those are great, great questions. And, and, uh, and I, I'm surprised that I forgot to sort of address it automatically. Um, okay. people, <laughs> people feel like, you know, look, Yafa doesn't care about the girls. Um, what a lot of people don't understand, because there's always an assumption, which is generally true, that the girls or the women get the shorter end of the stick. This is very interesting in this community. It's that the boys are the ones who get almost or, or completely no secular education. The girls tend to get a better education. So, for instance, their school days tend to be split in half, approximately half Jewish, half secular. Mm -hmm. um, so they got they get more than three hours of secular education. Um, the reason in being is, uh, I think, twofold. One, unlike the boys who are all groomed and destined to be rabbis, the girls, they can't be rabbis and Haredi and ultra-Orthodox Judaism. Um, number two, one of the um, Judaic books or, you know, that, that boys do spend almost their entire day studying is Talmud. Women and girls are prohibited from studying the Talmud. So now they have a big gap in their day that they can spend on secular education. And from a common sense perspective, if their husband, their future husband is gonna grow up to be a rabbi, who's not gonna be able to necessarily support themselves, the women are there to, the girls are there to sort of um, complement in that marriage. The, the, the challenge with that of course becomes that as soon as they get married and they start having kids, um, right? Contraception is not, a, is not accepted in, in ultra-Orthodox Judaism. So it becomes a double burden of both raising kids 
having kids, raising kids, mm -hmm. and providing for the family. So it may not end up in the long run getting a great, getting a better education may not necessarily uh, pay off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. sure. I just wanted to add something also, which is that um, not very long ago in these very yeshivas, yeshivot, the secular education was better. I must confess that my husband, who again connected to Columbia, went to some pretty right wing yeshivot, wrote about it, and he said they got the public school teachers, these seasoned public school teachers coming in at the end of the day. And in fact, it's fascinating. Some of the conversation I have seen on Facebook had to do with guys now in their 60s or 70s talking about, oh, we received that. And they're not aware of how much has been peeled away. Once upon a time, it wasn't as trafe as it is now. And I think it's there has been a demonization of secular education. Um, I don't recall if it was in this article. There's just been so much that um, some students are told they cannot speak English at home. And I'll also say one thing that we are aware of, and it's been our on our agenda in Yafed to explore this further, we're aware that people secretly seek tutoring for their children, right? But it has to be very hush-hush because it's frowned upon. I mean, imagine that. Again, the parents want what's best for their children. The community is aghast, but people with means or just the ability or just the fortitude to do that provide that for their children. I do want to say just one other thing about Jewish day schools. And um, David, I was I was happy to see that in your bio, you said that you are the father of Jewish day school students and Jane, you and I are. And I'm a proud graduate of North Shore Hebrew Academy in Great Neck and the Ramaz School. And I have to say that I would imagine, I would hope that the heads of Jewish day schools across the den denominational divide join this conversation and point out that it's it's false to state that a dual curriculum, such as the dual curricula offered by these very fine stellar schools in any way compromises religious identity. Those of us who've gone through this system, we may complain. What I could have complained about as a parent is tuition. What a pleasure to complain that we're paying too much when we're getting, our children are getting phenomenal um, education. So I would hope that the future life of this article is that we see the heads of Jewish day schools promoting this model, right? And it can be adapted. We're, we don't believe at Yafed that every Hasidic school has to offer as, you know, what the Heschel School or Hannah Senesh or Maimonides or Charles E. Smith, what, whatever it happens to be, or SAR, another great school, let them scale it to their community, but provide English, math, science, and social studies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You know, um, David, I, I was wondering if you could uh, speak to this because it's something both Natalie and Shira mentioned, and that is the evolution of these yeshiva, um, that, that there was a time when there was a higher component of secular education in the curriculum. So what's changed? I, I, I think what's changed is uh, what we see in, in the larger society, this, this um, uh, uh, opposition to, to government regulation. Uh, I, I came to this, I'm, I'm not sure it's cause and effect, but at the same time that I was aware of this situation, I was aware of the measles outbreak in um, Rockland County and in, in Brooklyn because there was an anti-vax movement within the Hasidic community. Uh, and and I, I worked, I wrote uh, about removing the religious exemption because again, I think that people have to understand that, that while it's easy to think and, and I think the Haredi uh, present themselves as an insular community that has nothing to do with the rest of society. So let us just live in peace. Well, you know, the microbes don't respect that insularity. The voting booth doesn't respect that insularity. 
And, and, and so I think what we see is this antagonistic uh, attitude and to some degree, uh, you know, if, if, you know, I was, as, as my grandparents were forced to leave Romania because of pogroms, if, if, you know, I was, if because of the history of the Jews and particularly the Haredi community feeling that government is antagonistic, I can understand that. But living in a democratic society, which they are more than happy to take advantage of in terms of the voting booth, in terms of public funding, uh, it's important to understand that we all have an interest in making sure that kids have a sound, basic education as guaranteed by the New York State Constitution. Thank you. So one of the other things that you hear from critics is that a story like this and indeed the sort of campaign to, to bring secular education to yeshivas, that that promotes anti-Semitism. And I'm wondering if any of you would like to respond to that. Oh, that, that is a big one. Um, we can have a whole panel just on that. And I will tell you, um, it's, it's whether, whether it has merit or not, I will say the charge that, that has been used against us has certainly been effective. In other words, um, had it not been for that charge being thrown around for all these years by yeshiva leaders, I feel like change would have happened sooner. Um, there are a lot of elected officials, reporters, and policymakers, um, and the general public who, who, you know, when they hear the word anti-Semitism coming from the other side, which is happening all day long, they really get, uh, you know, they pause and, and they back away. Um, in my opinion, there's no merit to it. I feel like, um, you know, I have a friend who's, who's an activist in the UK, um, Yehudis Fletcher, I'll give her a shout out. Um, and she, she, made, she gave me this quote that I thought was amazing. I'm probably going to butcher it. But she said something like, you know, I'm sorry, but the abuses in the community can't wait until we eradicate anti-Semitism, right? And it's like, I'm sorry, but we've got problems and we have to be able to address it. And you know what? Community leaders didn't want to address it from within. How do I know? Because I tried. That was my first thing, going to community leaders, you know? And, and you know, the, I remember going to this, this administrator in the yeshiva that I attended, relatively open-minded guy. And when he heard about my plans and thinking, he was like, oh, Tully, give it up. Trust me, I tried. And he gave me this whole thing, like a whole, he had a whole plan that he had worked on to build the yeshiva, especially for kids who they don't even fit into the system. Give them a good education. Let them get some, some um, apprenticeship or, or vocational training. And even that was shut, was shut down. And he was basically like, don't waste your time. It's not going to happen. And mm -hmm. this was sort of the, the response. I remember approaching Rabbi David Zwiebel, executive vice president of Agudath Israel. And I, I told him about the issue and I said that they should do something about it. And he points to himself, he's like, what do you mean? I'm a yeshiva graduate and, and I'm a lawyer. And it was just such a disgusting response because he knows he went to a, a good Litvish, not Hasidic yeshiva. And yes, he went on to be, he went to college um, he was able to go to college, right? And then he went on to become an attorney. And, and that was the attitude. Um, and we've tried even after that. And they dismissed us. So yes, we have no choice but to get the government. And, and that's another thing. It's not like the government is coming after the yeshivas. They're simply reinforcing a, a law that has been on the books for 120 plus years. It just hasn't been enforced. They've noticed there's a problem. And, and it's not even just about the Hasidic yeshivas. If tomorrow some other religion, let's do an unnamed religion, forms a village in upstate New York and decides that the girls should not get an education, right? Which is usually what happens in, in some other countries, right? We would all be outraged. Ironically, even the Hasidic community would be outraged, um, right? I know, they've, I know how they feel about girls in Afghanistan being denied an education, right? There is, that's what this is about. Mm -hmm. It's about making sure the law is enforceable across the board. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to pick up on something because clearly part of anti-Semitic attitudes is lumping all Jews together. Um, and Haredi Jews are more identifiable by their dress and their behaviors. So 
Sadly, they are, are also more targeted. But Naftali, you've been saying a few times here about the differences between the Hasidic schools and the, and the Litvish schools. Just explain that for uh, so that people understand that part of what we need to do to combat anti-Semitism is talk about the great variety within the Jewish community as well. Correct. Um, and, and we have a, a decent guide um, that we've published specifically for this purpose to try to get people to understand the nuance of the different communities. In fact, it, anyone on the call, if they go to our website, yafed.org, um, under the resources tab, we have some reports, one of them from 2017, where we went to great lengths to explain where mm -hmm. the community is, where the problem is. Um, but, you know, I don't know if, if that's necessarily helpful in terms of any any, you know, allegations of anti-Semitism. I think it's more about, we need to be clear about where the problem is. And I think it would be helpful if those outside of the Hasidic community, those who those whose schools could serve as a model for the Hasidic community, should stand up. And you know, I would expect the leadership of schools like Ramaz and SAR, and even some of the more right wing, but still, um, you know, high performing schools, should stand up and say it is possible. We know because we're doing it. Instead, mm -hmm. you have some leaders either this completely silent, or there are some people. Um, in those positions who actually are providing cover to the yeshivas. I'll give you a concrete example. There are, there's this trio of Russia yeshivot, the heads of yeshivas, of the more left-leaning Litvish, uh, ultra-Orthodox, but not Hasidic crowd. And they wrote a letter to the state education department blasting the regulations that, that recently were proposed and in fact passed this morning. Um, and they were blasting it, but they started off their letter by saying, we say this, as the heads of, yesh of three yeshivas that offer the regions. Do you know what they said in that statement? They actually acknowledged that they've already undergone a review by the state education department because that's the only way they would qualify to administer the regions. And, and yet they're preventing Hasidic yeshivas from doing exactly what they are doing and offering to their students. That's the problem. We're doing what we can in terms of distinguishing and sort of zooming in, shining the spotlight exactly on where the problem is. People often say you paint with a broad brush. I'm like, in 2015, when we sent a letter to the mayor and to the city naming 39 very specific Hasidic yeshivas, how is that painting with a broad brush? Every single comment talks about where the problem is. We don't benefit from painting with a broad brush because then what do people do? They say, look, I know about Ramaz and they provide a great education. It's only the, the yeshiva leaders who benefit from this kind of muddying the waters, talking about yeshivas broadly. The Times talks about how they often use test scores um, from higher performing schools to cover for their failing um, schools. So that's the issue that we're dealing with. Thank you. I just want to explain to anybody who's uh, joining us from outside New York State. So to graduate from New York State, you need to pass regents exams in various subjects. And uh, that's what Naftali was referring to. David, did you want to... Well, I, I wanted to add, the fact, you know, some people uh, criticize the, the regulation and the law saying, you know, why are you going after the yeshivas? I, nobody's going after the yeshivas in particular. Uh, in fact, uh, it would be illegal to, to write a law saying that only yeshiva, ultra-Orthodox yeshivas had to teach secular studies because we assume everybody else is doing that. That's why the broad brush is the, the legal broad brush that constitutionally and, and fairly uh, all private schools are subject to the substantial equivalence requirement. And under the new regs, all, I, I don't think they're strong enough, but all private schools need to be investigated because the ones that aren't teaching secular studies aren't going to stand up and say, oh, where are the ones who aren't teaching secular studies? Mm -hmm. so the, the government really needs to investigate all the schools as a matter of obligation. And just the way that government looks at all restaurants, it doesn't just uh, go to the the little neighborhood mom and pop restaurant. It goes to Lutes as well uh, to make sure that healthy uh, meals are being served. We wanna make sure that healthy education 
at a, a on a limited basis is in taking place in every school. And I, I just want to ask you if you can briefly um, talk about these new regulations. So the State Board of Regents, is that uh, yes. uh, acted this morning? And I know we haven't had a chance to really read and analyze what they've done, but can you just briefly describe, David, what you think the significance is of this action? Right, well, I actually don't think it's very significant, but uh, that's, a, that's a personal and uh, professional point of view. Uh, we, have, we have a disagreement on that, and I want to be able to talk about it after David, So, but I'll let him go. Uh, okay. So, but uh, the, the way government works, is you have a, a statute like we've been talking about, the substantial equivalent statute, and then the administrative agency responsible for enforcing that statute comes up with regulations telling the field how it's going to be going about enforcing that statute. That's what these regulations are. Uh, the state education department uh, dragged its feet on these regulations for a long time. Then there was a court order saying that what was configured as something called guidance had to be issued as regs. So over the course of five years, these regs have now been approved, um, which may have a positive effect as Naftali believes. Uh, but I believe that it's given the all the schools, uh, if they want to take advantage of the loopholes in the the regs, to, uh, for example, get uh, accredited by some favorable agency, and poof, you're automatically viewed as giving substantially equivalent education if you're accredited, if you give the state tests. So that's a loophole because just because you give a test doesn't mean that you taught the material. And, and uh, you know, as a, as a teacher, I know that a test is just a sample of the information that might have been mm -hmm. taught, not every little piece of information that was taught. So, so but the state has uh, passed these regulations with what they call pathways towards substantial equivalence that I think are inadequate, but that's where we are as of this morning with the State Board of Regents passing the new regs for the substantial equivalence requirement. Okay, your response, Naftali. So, I mean, look, we, we largely agree that these regulations fall short, but, you know, throughout history, social change came in steps. And the way we see it is these regs are a step in the right direction. First, because it acknowledges there's a problem, right? Mm -hmm. And, and when, the, when the Board of Regents, you know, got the presentation, it clearly says there were complaints that were raised and, and they, they referenced us. And, and now with the times piece, obviously there's that additional sort of um, recognition. Um, but number two is one thing that these new regs do is something that most people in the public wouldn't even realize, they wouldn't pay attention to it because it's, it's the kind of thing that a group like Yafet struggles with a lot, but the public doesn't think about it. Right now, you can start a school in your basement, Jane, and you can start educating kids every single day and nobody even will know that your school exists. Nobody, nobody will even know that the kids that come to your school exist. In other words, it's not like once a, once a kid is enrolled in the public school system, for instance, and then they don't show up for a week, two weeks, a month, they get referred to ACS. The, the system knows they exist, and now they know that they're not showing up to school. The private school system has operated completely outside of that. And, and there's no requirement for a school to even tell the state that they exist, especially if they don't accept any state money. The law still applies to them though. So with these new regulations, the very first step is that every school district needs to know what schools exist in their boundaries, what non-public schools exist in their boundaries. By extension, that means the state will know, and then by extension, that means Yafed and the public will know as well. Then the next step is, they also need to know what each of the schools, which of the pathways that David was beginning to go into towards substantial equivalency, every single one of the schools choose, right? So if you're gonna choose the accreditation pathway, the district needs to know, and that means we will know. And that means that we can hold them accountable, especially once we start getting complaints from parents saying, my school's not providing an education. We say, okay, which pathway did the school claim they're doing? Okay, they're doing accreditation. Who's the accreditor? Right? It gives us a, a starting point 
that currently doesn't exist, right? Then it comes to the enforcement mechanism, which I will agree with David is a little bit more fuzzy um, um, and, and needs to be strengthened. So we're saying we, we, this is a good step in the right direction. We're urging the state education department and the board of regents to now strengthen it, especially in the forthcoming guidelines, right? These are the regulations. The next step will be guidelines that will then be implemented. So I just want to follow up quickly. What if I uh, decide to homeschool my children? Homeschool has always had very serious um, rules. In fact, I, I have friends who homeschool and uh, or used to in the past, and they are like, can you imagine what we had to go through? They have to send, I think, quarterly reports, and, and I think the kids okay. have to take assessments. And, and it's like, yes, if only, if only yeshivas and all other non-public schools um, mm. had even, even close to what uh, homeschoolers require. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. So uh, we're getting somewhat close to the end of our hour. I, I had one last point to ask you about. You know, it is clear that the leadership in some of these communities consider government regulation as an existential threat. That we could argue that it's not, but, but they see it that way. And so I'm just sort of wondering, what can the Jewish community, what can all of us either as individuals or certainly the institutions in the community do to respond. Shira and Naftali, you, you talked about uh, what you think other day school uh, leadership ought to be doing, but most uh, Jews don't go to day school. And, um, and certainly we have institutions that's, that are meant to serve all of us. How do we turn this into something that can be productive and not just put a community that already feels like it's being threatened either further uh, on the defensive. Jane, this is very important. And I learned something yesterday. We went up, Yafed went up to Albany yesterday. Um, and outside before the vote was taken by the Board of Regents, there were Hasidic protesters standing in the rain, with bags over their hats and there were children and there were signs that people would rather sit in jail. And, you know, my first inclination was to roll my eyes, look at this hyperbolic hysterical reaction. And they were reciting Tehillim, Psalms. And I have to say, it stopped me dead in my tracks. It really did. I took very, very seriously how threatened the community feels because their leadership has said, oy vey, this is a terrible, this is a Cossack moment, right? And so there is, a, there is and I don't think it's, it's wrong to feel a sense of ridiculing, but it just got me. It made me deeply upset. Tehillim are what you say at the graveside mm -hmm. of somebody. Tehillim are what you say when someone is gravely ill, when you're guarding a, a body before burial. I take this really seriously. I'm a rabbi's daughter, but it is a very, very big issue. And it goes back to the failure in the Jewish community that led to this article having to be written. This, it's, people know the heads of the Jewish communal organizations, the marvelous, effective, you know, highly evolved Jewish communal organizations, everybody knew, everybody knows. There is room, I want to be proactive because that is my nature, and I really feel that good journalism, and I think this was superb journalism, acts as a catalyst, right? We, we can pull out all kinds of examples. And I would hope that what this, the regulations may not be perfect, but this article and this public discourse is long overdue and let this be a catalyst for the heads of the community to create conversations within the community between leaders in, in mm -hmm. Hasidic communities of the various communities because these are individual, various, unique communities and other communities. Information share. I have heard so many innovative ideas about training teachers from within. Um, whatever the solution, there are a multiplicity of solutions as long as we all come together and say, this is about the future of these children who are, after all, Jewish children. 
So. Thank you. Uh, Naftali, David, what are your, would your, be your suggestions and hopes? I'll let David go first. Well, you know, uh, I'm kind of the, the public sector guy. So uh, understand that uh, the funding and the enforcement are in the hands of public officials. Um, Bill de Blasio um, horse traded and slow walked. Uh, it looks like Eric Adams uh, is going to be pursuing the same strategy. Um, Governor Hochul has said it's not her problem, it's a state ed problem. Uh, it was notable that state ed in passing these regs today had not one comment about the Times article. Uh, you know that uh, that uh, Senator Schu uh, Schumer personally, I mean, at the last minute during a COVID relief bill, dumped $2.75 billion of federal funds, taxpayer funds on non-public schools. Uh, people need to, to lobby their public officials for, for action. And uh, this is not an attack. Uh, this is a a uh, public sector issue as much as it is a private school issue. Mm -hmm. Naftali, what would be your response? So um, there, are a few, there are a few things I wanna say. First of all, the problem you raise is a real one, um, but I also think that it's, it, it goes back to the way the Haredi leaders have chosen to pursue this mm -hmm. issue. You have to understand, the Haredi, the Haredi, a big part of this problem is the Haredi media ecosystem. The, the media that most, the vast majority of Haredi people, these are ultra-Orthodox Jews, consume is, is highly censored um, and, and go through a, 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 an approval process by the rabbis of the community. You could see them basically as propaganda arms for the leaders. So for instance, when they talk about efforts to improve secular education, it's all framed of like, an attack and, and everyone who's raising awareness about this like us are called rotten, losers, disgruntled. The, and then they go to a good Israel and ask them for a quote and they put in a nice fancy quote. Um, and, and if you're a reader and you just constantly consume this, they're out to get us, they're out to get us. It is a big obstacle. Yafet has worked a little bit to sort of get through to parents. Like we have a Yiddish newsletter that we mail, physical mailing to directly to people's homes just to bypass this extreme censorship, um, which is really a big part of this story, although it has implications far beyond secular education. So that's a big obstacle, but I do wanna echo what Shira said. I do think the broader Jewish community has a lot more power than they're claiming they do. Like the UJA Federation literally funnels a lot, a lot of money to the yeshivas, either directly, they have some programs, some go through the Jewish Education Project, the Met Council, there's so much money that is going in that direction, obviously very little money coming back from the community to the UJA. They have a lot more leverage than they would like to lead on. Mm -hmm. And if they were to speak out, so, so first of all, they could speak to the community leaders and pressure them to, to um, improve, but they can also speak up to government officials and show, don't let them tell you that the Jews are against it. Right, because right now, when you have a bunch of Jewish people, leaders like Agudath Israel, uh, Satmar leaders saying that the Jews are opposed to this, and you don't have a vocal uh, group from the Jewish leadership, like the UJA saying, no, 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 we support this, then if you're an elected official or a policymaker, you're inclined to say, fine, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, get into this, right? So it is very important for the broader Jewish community to speak up and uh, demand change. And I think. That alone would balance it out. And the, the yeshiva leaders would see that the days where they have the undivided attention of the government and they can push this single-sided narrative that this is, you're, you're attacking our way of life are over and that they have to start making improvements. And they will. I know a parent yesterday showed me a letter from her son's school. Her son's school is under investigation. Um, and and her, son sent home a her son's school sent home a letter that they're serious now about secular education. They're starting secular education now, I think today. Usually they wait till after Sukkot, right? Until then it's all Judaic education. So they're starting secular education. It's still only the 90 minutes. It's still very little. 
but they're starting to take it more mm -hmm. seriously, a, a more robust curriculum. Pressure will help. Yes, they'll try to fight it, but it's like I, I say, it's like every business doesn't want regulations and they'll fight it. They'll spend millions in lobbying costs to fight regulation. But then if somehow they're not successful and the regulations pass, what do they do? They comply and that's it. And life goes on. People are safer, working conditions are safer. In this case, kids will get a better education and it'll be good for everyone, including for the Jews. Well, thank you. Uh, we, were, we are at the end of our hour. I um, want to thank the hundreds of people who have tuned into this conversation. And uh, please share what you've learned and continue it in your own way. Very special thanks to Shira Dicker, David Bloomfield and Naftali Muster for all the work that you're doing, for sharing your insights and your passions. And to all of you who are listening, and I hope learning from uh, what the impact of extraordinary journalism can really be. Thank you. And thank you so much, Jane, for moderating it. Uh, this was excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye.